Oh, okay. So everyone's here for the fermentation session. Okay, I'm gonna get started. So, um, I'm Haley. I'm one of the co-organizers here for today's event and co-founder of Food and Out Club and on campus. And this semester, I've been teaching with my club um, and with the, my fellow three co-founders of Food and Out a fermentation class on campus. It's offered to um, students of all ages, and we've been exploring different fermented foods from coffee, breads, yogurt, um, cheeses, and um, the sauerkraut. And it was such a great pleasure to have Karen come in to speak for us, pies and sampling, and do a, um, a kimchi hands-on making session with us students. And so today, uh, I'm bringing her back again, and with Matt Gill <coughs> from PH Cheese. He's, a, he's the co-founder and I mean, the founder and head of operations for TH Cheese, which is a cannabis business uh, focused on fermented edibles. And um, they'll lead the session today <coughs> and talk about different aspects of fermentation, the business side, and also um, Karen will touch on the microbiome health and uh, the future of that. Thank you. Hope you enjoy. Uh, thanks, Haley. So I don't need to use this anymore, right? Yeah. Okay. No, okay. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm just going to take the first 30 minutes or so, and then um, I'm going to transition to Matt. Yeah. So um, and if you want to come a little bit closer, that's fine too. Uh, I was asked to do a demo and then give you some tasting and talk about health aspects of fermentation. And I'm going to make it really uh, succinct and quick. 30 minutes is not a lot of time. So I'm just going to try and share with you uh, everything that I've learned through the course of being a chef uh, and also a nutritionist. And now I'm actually the chief uh, fermentation officer at CrowdSource. So I created a device um, here. And um, for those of you who sat in on the talk before, on science and technology, my product is kind of the antithesis of technology because there's nothing to plug in. It doesn't connect to an app. Uh, it's just very manual. Um, and it's reviving the art of fermentation or the art of appreciating fermented foods with good <coughs> microbial uh, concentration or microbes. And what really gets me super excited when I do presentation is that you know, because we've been able to sequence the human DNA, now we know how many genes humans have. So actually, do you know how many genes humans have? This is not like intellectual questions. I'm really interested. <laughs> so just to give you, you can take a guess. Um, Rat, like a lab rat, has 23,000 genes. Um, there's a worm called C. elegans that they use in laboratories a lot, and that worm has 20,000 genes. Actually, 20,500 genes. <coughs> so where do you think humans stand as far as our gene numbers? Yes? Slightly above the rest. Slightly above the rest. Good guess. Um, so slightly, actually no, slightly below rest, right? but slightly above the worm. Okay. So we are at 21,000 genes. However, in our microbiome, and this is a buzzword that like, is, is used a lot nowadays, even Michael Pollan has wrote about microbiome. So in our, in our ecosystem as a human being from head to toe, we have something like over 4 million genes. But if the human DNA only constitutes 21,000, what is the rest? So the rest is other. So what microbiologists have come up with now is that we are actually 10% human, 90% microbial matter, a living colony, a living ecosystem of fungi, archaea, and um, bacteria, living in a hopefully coexisting way to make us healthy or not healthy. So that's what I found really fascinating because we are experiencing a lot of degradation of the exterior microbiome, the soil, the air, the water. That's the exterior microbiome. But at the same time, we're experiencing a lot of health problems with our internal microbiome, our gut, um, you know, our health, uh, a lot of um, what we call um, kind of modern diseases of cancer and things that has to do with our central nervous system. So. Internally, our microbiome is kind of off, and externally, uh, the environment is off. But both of them actually can really be served with more bacteria. So since the Industrial Revolution, we've been trained to think that everything should be 
pasteurized. Everything should be sterilized. But now scientists are beginning to realize that since we need to live in an ecosystem, we need these bacteria to really function as individuals, as a community, and also if you take that to the broader perspective, you know, as, a, as an Earth ecosystem. And we are a part of that ecosystem. So that's why I'm excited about fermented foods, because it's bringing back that aspect of eating live cultures that will um, benefit us as we know it, that 10% human. But more importantly, it's going to benefit that 90% of other, which needs to um, coexist with us. So that's the, the beauty of fermented foods. You know, and Matt is going to touch upon another aspect of fermented foods. But very quickly, um, for those of you who have never made sauerkraut or kimchi or pickles, I'm just going to do like a five minute like condensed version of it to show you how simple it is. Actually, does anyone know sauerkraut or kimchi? OK, so you kind of know the idea. So the, at, at its easiest uh, aspect, you just grab some cabbage and grab some salt. Um, I like to use a high quality sea salt. Don't use table salt because it's highly processed and there's a lot of additives to it. So you just grab your cabbage, preferably organic or at least you know, locally grown. Throw some salt on it. And you get your hands going and just massage it. Great project with kids. Um, great project for yourself. This is a great way to work out some aggression. <laughs> Um, so you just massage it, and by massaging it, you're, you are breaking down the cellulose of the, uh, of the plant, and then also working the salt into it to release its own inherent um, moisture. So that's what we want in traditional sauerkraut. So, so that's it, and for those people who do not like to cook, I tell them fermentation is not cooking. You don't need to turn on the stove. You just need to pack it into a jar, and let time do its fermentation magic. So after you've massaged it, um, traditionally people would put it into big crocks. You know, there'd be like big earthen crocks or barrels, that's what our ancestors used. And they would pack it in really tight and then um, there would be the salt and the brine from it or any kind of liquid that comes out. And they would pack it in. And there's three main important points about lacto fermentation. You need to keep it submerged underneath the brine. Uh, it needs to be anaerobic, so no air going in. And then, um, you need to let it burp, or you need to outgas. So while something's fermenting, there's carbon dioxide, or CO2, that's produced. So the CO2 needs to escape. So these are the three uh, major things. Keep it submerged, no oxygen going in, and then allow CO2 to escape. So in the old days, like I said, if you're from Eastern Europe or from Asia, it was all traditionally done in a large barrel. Um, problem with that is we're no longer like living in a village and um, we don't really have time to chop up 10 pounds of cabbage to make a sauerkraut. So good thing we're in the 21st century and mason jars are around. So everybody has a mason jar or you should have a mason jar. So there are many small batch systems now where you can make your own fermented superfood at home. So um, if you don't have any other device, you can actually, if you have a mason jar and some cabbage, after you massage it, you pack it in, just like what I'm doing. And you can also add in spices, anything that you want. Um, you can be very creative about that. So salt is the, the major thing, but you can add in caraway seeds. That's very traditionally German. You can add in juniper berries. I add in organic roses, uh, vanilla, turmeric, chili. So when you make it at home, you can be really, really creative. And then you pack it in like this. And then you just keep on doing that until you reach the shoulder of the jar. And then after you've done this, so this is the modern style of uh, the big barrel. So even if you have a big barrel, you would do the same thing as what I'm doing right now. The same principle. And so we just want to pack it in and with cabbage, or if you're doing kimchi, you know, kimchi, everyone's like obsessed about kimchi. So kimchi is just like the Asian version of sauerkraut because we're using a different kind of cabbage. We are adding chili and garlic and all of that to it, um, which is probably on the palate more exciting than German sauerkraut, but you know, they're, they're both really awesome. So you're packing it in like this. And then after you have it completely packed in, Um, 
if we had time, this would be releasing a lot of liquid, so then you would see a lot of liquid coming to the top. But because we don't have time, um, there is some liquid here. But pretend there's some liquid here. So this is sauerkraut, but you can also ferment vegetables that will not release a lot of liquid, like cauliflower or um, cucumbers into pickles. When you have a vegetable that doesn't have a lot of liquid, then you need to make a brine. So brine is basically just salt and water. So this is what's in here, uh, the brine with your ingredients. So the next part, once you have it all in, is you have to devise a way to keep it submerged underneath the brine, and then cover it in a fashion where the CO2 can escape and oxygen doesn't go in. So if you don't have a system, you can actually like grab another jar, preferably glass, and weigh it down like this, and then cover it with a cloth, and then put it in your kitchen and, and let it ferment. So that is like the most simple way of doing that. If you want to get a system, um, you know, this is, this is the one that I created. So I'll just show you on this. You need to have a weight, okay? And then this is actually a downward spring. So it has about two pounds of force going in. And then you lock it on like this and suspend it over the jar. Put the mason jar ring on and then you let this drop. So when it drops, it pushes everything down, keeps it submerged. And then there's a well here. So this is based on really old technology, as in probably at least five or 600 years old, if not a 1,000. Um, someone realized a long time ago that when you have a well and you fill it with water, it's a one-way airlock, because oxygen doesn't penetrate water. So you put the cap on, and you fill this with water. That way, the CO2 can escape but um, oxygen won't penetrate. So you have a closed system here for fermentation. And so the principles right here is basically your basic idea if you want to rig up your own system. Um, I designed this because as a chef, I was struggling with thinking, how can I make this so easy and popular that everyone starts fermenting at home? And that's really my goal. I would like people to just like start fermenting, enjoying good microbes in their daily diet. So therefore, um, I shrank down this whole system to fit onto a mason jar. Um, and actually, I also did a Kickstarter campaign um, and was successful. But more so than the success, what really spoke to me was that people from around the world contributed to, to the campaign. And I suddenly realized, wow, there's a lot of people who are interested in fermentation. And a lot of people who remember that their grandparents or their parents were doing a lot of fermented foods at home. Um, beyond sauerkraut and kimchi, I mean, you know, making miso, or um, making yogurt, and making cheese, making beer, making wine. So fermented foods has been with us for, I think, as long as we have been humans eating. Um, the fermentation process though, is very interesting because it breaks down a lot of what we call anti-nutrients, such as phytic acid, that makes the food much more digestible for us. And digestion is really the core of good health. Um, you could be eating the most fantastic food ever. You know, organically sourced, biodynamic, prepared by the most famous chef. But if you cannot digest the food, then you can't pull off the nutrient from it. And so this is, again, where fermented foods uh, really come in, particularly things like sauerkraut or kimchi. When you're eating it with a meal, that actually optimizes your capacity for digestion. It actually changes the pH of your um, uh, hydrochloric acid or your digestive juices and makes that meal much more digestible. And the sad thing is when you're young, like as in university students, you guys know you probably eat a lot of crap, but you feel okay. <laughs> but you got through your schools and you know you did your finals and you're okay. The problem is as you age, and then when I say age, when you hit your 30s and 40s, hydrochloric acid starts to plummet. So it's like a straight line down. Okay? Um, and that's why as people get older, they experience a lot more health issues than younger people. It has to do with digestion and your capacity to assimilate. So it's not really what you eat, it's what you're able to digest. So as we age, we really want to look at how well we can digest something. And fermented foods have been our ally since you know, we started preserving food. Um, on top of that, it is one of the traditional ways of preserving food. Um, along with salt, just drying something in the air. Somewhere people recognize that when we preserve foods this way, it becomes um, shelf stable in a way, and it's a food that will keep for a long time. So you ferment at room temperature, and when something is done, 
you store it in the refrigerator. In the refrigerator, it doesn't stop. It's still fermenting, but it's just like it's asleep. It's still breathing, but it's very, very slow. It's still alive. So when you eat that, you are actually taking in live cultures that are in symbiotic relationship with all the microbes that we have. Um, you know, initially in the digestive uh, tract in the stomach, but ultimately it benefits our whole body. Again, we, you know, we are looking at an ecosystem. So that's the power of fermented foods, and that's why I'm really excited about this trend. And I hope it's not going to be a trend, um, like I don't know what's a trend. Uh, toast. Toast. <laughs> Thank you. Five dollar toast. <laughs> hopefully, it's not just like a toast trend. Um, hopefully, it's going to be a viable recognition, a hearkening of what our ancestors have been doing for hundreds, thousands of years, and we need to make that reconnection. Um, because I think un until we realize that we have this profound connection with food, and the food is not only feeding me or you as an individual, it's feeding like this microbiome, the symbiotic ecosystem um, that we're sort of you know, living in, then I think that's how we are going to start healing ourselves and the planet, and I think that's really true sustainability. When someone can look at a head of cabbage and say, you know, I bring it home from the farmer's market, I make my own sauerkraut, and it's going to become my own superfood because it provides probiotics, it provides enzymes and vitamins, and um, it's so easy to do. And that's kind of like, I hope, at where we're going. Um, technology is awesome. Without technology and Kickstarter, I couldn't have funded my project. But at the same time, I think we need to look at the core of where food comes from and just get into the kitchen again. Like I said, if you don't like to cook, you don't have to cook. This doesn't involve cooking. What I did was like five minutes, right? So I encourage all of you to kind of um, try that if you haven't done so already. Or if you don't want to make it at home, at least go to the supermarket and buy some kimchi and sauerkraut that has live cultures in it and sort of experience that for yourself. So at this point, I'm going to transition over to Matt. Um, there are some recipe cards here. You're welcome to take it. And then after Matt is done, I'll open these two containers up, and then we can all share some fermented foods. Okay. Thanks. So Matt. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. I'm Matt Gill. Um, I break the law probably about once every three months. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little later. <laughs> uh, Meanwhile, if anyone has any questions or like, want to talk a little bit more about what they're touching on, just feel free to raise your hand. Yeah, please. I, I do better with interaction, actually. Uh, so yeah, to touch on uh, what Haley said earlier, uh, what pays my rent right now is actually I work at this uh, private club downtown called Wingtip. Uh, I'm the specialty food director. I've been doing uh, import-export specialty foods for almost a decade now. Uh, that includes everything from my favorite food, which is cheese, obviously, uh, to caviar, truffles, uh, jamon iberico. Uh, you had the chef last time say that he wanted to stop cooking for the 1% and go to the 100%. I'm in that transitional period. I'm trying to get there as well. But for right now, I really do kind of deal with people that can, uh, that can afford a, a certain lifestyle. Uh, and my main goal is to educate. Um, this is me actually teaching a, a summer camp. There's Sprouts, uh, a little offshoot of Alice Waters uh, Edible Schoolyard. We invited them into the club. Uh, I'm teaching them about French cheese right now. Um, this is a little Conte Ete. And if you've never seen it before, young people Learning where their food comes from is probably uh, a future project of mine that really, really touches my heart. Um, especially when you see faces like this. <laughs> and they're just amazed that 80 pound wheels of cheese really, uh, really exist and, and just how large that gets. Yeah? Uh, just to clarify, is this the Sprouts Cooking Club? This is the Sprouts Cooking Club with oh, Karen Rogers. Yeah, that's right. Um, my main audience tends to be adults, though. Uh, if you look here, you'll see uh, my friend Solomon uh, learning how to really improperly cut a Mona Barico. Please don't judge me on how this is cut. Uh, right now, he's, he's using a very sharp knife and trying to learn how to uh, cut something uh, really, really thin. Uh, this gets a bit more into curing, which we'll touch on in a minute. Uh, we're going to deal with fermentation today. Uh, in my job, I, I, I'm really lucky. I get to work with some of the best ingredients uh, in the world. This is about, yo. I'm sorry, maybe I missed it. What's your background? And how do you know how to do this? How do I know how to do this? Mostly import, export. I've been in the food industry in retail, wholesale, restaurant production 
for almost 10 years. So uh, to give you a little bit more background on me, um, I probably started off at my first restaurant when I was 18. I was going to school uh, for a very obscure branch of psychology. Uh, absolutely hated it. Uh, and then my father, uh, this isn't a story I normally tell people, but my father, who was helping me with my education, uh, actually got arrested with 900 pounds of cannabis and went away for about 10 years. Uh, <laughs> when that happened, I decided to uh, focus on food. Uh, and from there, I was really lucky to have uh, a few chefs really kind of take me under their wing. Uh, Luca down in Irvine, uh, which is now Providence in Balboa, uh, Balboa Park, if you guys ever get down there, Kathy has an absolutely beautiful garden right outside. And she said, well, why don't you take a couple semesters off and come to the kitchen with me and, and learn about these, these foods? And I said, well, I don't really know anything about it. And she said, well, I'll teach you. And she did. Uh, so in Southern California, all the way up to Northern California, I kind of uh, palled around to these different farms, these different restaurants, uh, until I realized that I really wanted to see how the United States produced food. That's, that's what I could afford at the time, honestly. So I bought, a, I bought an 86 Honda. <laughs> the thing was as old as I was, and I ended up driving uh, uh, pretty much from Laguna Beach, where I was living at the time, uh, through the south, up to uh, where I grew up, which is in Ohio. Uh, and then drove back down and, and flew back. Uh, through that experience, I've gotten to work with uh, dairy farmers, with uh, uh, factory farms, which uh, I got away from pretty quick. Uh, and nowadays, I work with, actually, uh, this is a local caviar farm about two hours north of here. Uh, this is a, a, a white sturgeon that I, actually a three-foot white sturgeon that I slid open and stuffed with about a kilo and a half of caviar for, uh, for a small event uh, at our club. Um, but yeah, I get, to, I get to touch with Spanish ham, Homona Berico, uh, with a little mezcal. Um, and then my most recent one was actually uh, uh, truffles. And when you get into microbiomes, when you get into these small little, little critters, which I've fallen in love with and the, the type of food that I, I personally gravitate to, um, truffles are kind of fascinating because we, we talk about the microbiome in the body. We talk about uh, uh, what's happening in lactofermentation uh, on the table here. Uh, this is kind of this really cool cooperation between a fungus, uh, a microbe, and a tree, creating this really nice symbiotic relationship. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to that a little later. Uh, how this company started, TH Cheese, uh, which is a company that focuses on camembert, cheddar, uh, pickles, uh, and other fermented goods. We're going to do a lacto-fermented hot sauce today, uh, and foie gras, because I know a sustainable foie gras producer, and, and why the hell wouldn't you want to eat foie gras that gets you high? <laughs> um, um, uh, but yeah, those are the things we touch on. Uh, about three years ago, I was diagnosed with a very rare form of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, I was in the hospital about two weeks out of every month, and then the weeks that I wasn't in there, I would have to go in and get chemo. And the food that they feed you at hospitals, shockingly enough, does not uh, uh, cultivate cultivate health. Uh, it's not what I wanted to eat. It's, it's not what gets you back on the road. Uh, and at the time, I met this guy, Trevor. Uh, Trevor Milbury with his, he, we're, sh we're milk shopping here actually. <laughs> uh, we're trying to find a single source for our milk so that we can know our farmer. We, we do uh, farm to table food, farm to table cannabis. Uh, this is, it's named after a pop star. It's not or, uh, a 70s rock star. It's not Stevie Nicks, but it's, it's a weird pun of that. Uh, and he really fell in love with him. But Trevor came in. He was finishing up with culinary school. Uh, and he said, what do you want to eat? And I said, well, I can only taste sweet things. My taste buds have died. So he started off with chocolate. And then as my taste buds grew back, uh, he came back uh, and started experimenting with more and more uh, different ways to incorporate cannabis into food. Um, and we knew that we wanted to, to really pursue this and find a way to... Uh, uh, to follow our passion, which was, respectively, uh, food and farming uh, and, and cannabis. <laughs> uh, it really helped me kind of, of come out of my space, and it actually took us about, uh, about eight months to figure out that we were going to do cheese, which was kind of silly because we met at a cheese shop. Uh, that's, that's, that was my, my one wholesale, uh, my last wholesale experience before going into private buying. Um, here he is communing with, with some cows up in Petaluma. Uh, so we, we came up with this thing, and he actually did this really cool thing. He did a, a milk lipid extraction uh, with THC. 
uh, which will eventually uh, apply to CBD. Uh, even though people look at edibles and they're like, oh, that gets you high, that's really cool. Uh, the future of edibles, and actually the future of cannabis, is in uh, cannabinols. Uh, uh, not, necessarily, not necessarily tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, which is the psychoactive component, uh, but these, uh, these uh, anti-carcinogenic agents uh, that we'll be working with in the future. So even though right now we're, we're kind of uh, like I said, breaking law about once every three months. Uh, in the future, we're going to be creating food that not only supports this, uh, uh, this super organism that you are, uh, but also uh, hopefully imparts a little bit more of a terpene content, of a cannabinol content that we're starting to find more and more is really good for you. Um, uh, and then when we did come up with the, with the cheese thing, uh, that's when my other business partner, Juliana, who's uh, in Hervé, this is her in Hervé Mon, uh, which is an affinage. Does everybody know what affinage is? Uh, cheese aging. So you have the fruit in French, you have the fruitier, uh, the person who uh, essentially is the farmer. You have the fromager, the person who makes the cheese. You have the affinor, the person who ages the cheese. So Juliana, uh, who uh, is one of the best cheesemongers in the country, according to the Cheesemonger Invitational back in 2014, and one of the only French-trained affinors here on the West Coast, uh, said, hey, let me come in, let me refine what you guys are doing, uh, and, and, and I'll help you do it. And so that's how she came on, on the end. Uh, one of the things that I like to tell people is that we are not trying to come into the food world and update you. We're not trying to come into cannabis culture and, and, and make it really fancy. We actually love cannabis culture. I, I come from a belly dancing, yoga instructing, hippie uh, grandmother who raised me along with, with prison dad. Uh, so I'm not really trying to change that. I got to work in some really amazing restaurants as a garment J, uh, in front of the house, in back of the house. Uh, and I think one of the important things that I try to do is create a bridge. I don't want to change the experience you have when you go out to eat. I don't want to change how you eat at home. Uh, I, I kind of want you to have this experience with, with a group of friends uh, where you can bring a wheel of camembert and you have something that's, that's medicated specifically for you. Uh, because right now, if you look at the market, you see these 200 milligram THC cheesecakes or these 200 milligram cookies and it doesn't really make sense because who wants to eat one bite of a cookie and then wrap it up in foil, put it in the fridge and then forget about it. Uh, all of our stuff is very low dose. Uh, it's to the point where if you're not a consumer uh, and you only want to have about eight milligrams a day, which is what, what I would recommend for you if you're not a, a daily consumer, uh, you can have a quarter wheel of camembert and that will put you in a space where you're not knocked down, drag out unconscious. Uh, the comparison that we use a lot is you don't want to have one beer and be hammered, just like you don't want to have 10 beers uh, and not feel anything at all. That's not the, that's not the point of drinking the beer. Uh, but we do try to uh, pay homage kind of to, to our roots. This is uh, actually Brownie Mary. There's a, there's a place on 17th and Folsom uh, where Dennis Perone came back from Vietnam back in 1969 and actually started selling cannabis to AIDS and cancer patients. And the federal government wanted to come in and shut him down. Uh, and actually San Francisco police uh, told them to back off. They were going through an epidemic. Uh, and his friend, Brownie Mary, who I met right before she passed away, she was 92, um, was the original creator of the, of the edible brownie and would go out and hand it out to people in Dolores Park and, and, and kind of keep up with that. Um, this is just a little a cheese display I did for a young lady. Uh, but yeah, our goal is to create this bridge. And if you see uh, uh, very classic uh, uh, recipes that we're pretty familiar with, right now we're doing camembert. We're about to start our R&D on, on uh, some cheddar stuff. Um, but, but kind of creating this marriage. Uh, this is Mary. She's our mascot, little Jersey cow. That is one really angry farmer, by the way. I don't know if you guys know how much a cow eats, but it's, it's quite a lot. So to be in the middle of a cannabis field is, is kind of killing both of your crops there. Um, we are focused on farming standards. Uh, one of the things that is really important to me as I got to travel around the country is to see how these really small farms on the animal side uh, really tried to maintain a, a sense of culture. I think it's kind of interesting the way it was, it was set up today. You guys just got out of a technology talk right before this one, uh, which, which really innovates and kind of does these future things. Karen and I do these things that are very much so an homage to the past. <laughs> uh, uh, so one of the things that I try to focus on is how are they sustainable? Somebody earlier asked a question about organic. I don't really see USDA organic uh, the same way that most people do. 
uh, the rules there are really lax. If something is Japanese organic, if something is Swiss organic, if something is Swedish organic, that carries a lot more weight with me because I know that those standards are a little bit higher. Um, and I'm going to hold my cannabis farmer, who I know very well, uh, to those same standards. I want to make sure that he's not using certain pesticides. I want to make sure that uh, when he's growing, his, his plants are happy. I want to make sure that he knows the percentage of his psychoactive drugs as well as the percentage of his, of his anti-carcinogenic uh, uh, properties as well. Um, our first love is obviously cheese. Uh, this is something that I, I do for the club about three nights a week. I, I have the St. Regis old cheese cart and I fill it up with cheese and I push it around and I pair it with different things that I really love. Uh, our goal is to create this kind of, uh, this kind of food experience, but, but something that by the end will leave, you, will leave you hopefully a little bit more elevated. Um, today, unfortunately, most of the things that I have post-fermentation uh, would be medicated, so I can't really give that to you guys because I try to avoid going to jail myself. Um, <laughs> this is actually my videographer, her and I dueling with swords. But I did want to touch, uh, Karen touched a little bit about uh, 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 kraut fermentation, and I did want to touch a little bit on dairy since that's my first passion. Uh, here you can kind of see the process. Does everybody know how cheese is made or not really? Not really. Uh, so first you have an amazing milk source, uh, uh, which we're still shopping for. And from there, you actually add a, a little rennet. And rennet is usually from the, the stomach of the baby. Uh, the only reason babies can really survive off of a liquid sustenance is because once it hits their stomach, it curdles, it turns into a solid, and that's how they'll, they'll derive their nutrients. So a lot of vegetarians that replace uh, uh, some of their stuff with cheese, uh, you are not having a vegetarian product a lot of the time, unless you're having something Spanish, unless you're having something uh, where it's specifically derived from a lab or from a vegetable rennet. Uh, here you see uh, uh, really what happens. So once we add that rennet, we, we essentially bring the milk up to body temperature that creates a healthy environment uh, for these natural yeasts and for these uh, uh, bacillus cultures uh, to really thrive. And this thing, uh, and then it starts to curdle. Uh, once that happens, we try to initiate something called flocculation, which is the separation of the liquid or the whey from the solid, which is the curd. And so here you see a, a large 125 gallon vat um, cutting the curd, uh, and you try to get it down to, to size. And really what you're looking for is this jello-like consistency. And when you first see it, uh, the way that I got taught to do it was to take a milk cap and to put it on top of the vat. And if, if the cap didn't sink or if it didn't look too puddingy, then, then it was ready to cut and make curd for cheese. Um, from here, and this is just a very basic recipe, uh, you have to keep in mind there are 235 different recipes for cheese just in France, each with about 10 different variations. So in one country alone, you have, within its history, about 235,000 different kinds. Um, after that, you guys have, uh, or after that, you, you take the curds, you drain the whey away, uh, and that's where you get your whey protein powder for anybody that goes to the gym a lot, or uh, nowadays fermented whey drinks, which are incredibly good for you. Um, and they're poured into these molds. Uh, the reason I can't really do a demonstration on, on why, the reason I can't really do a cheese demonstration are because they're poured into these molds, and then after about 12 hours, you have something like this, but during those 12 hours, we're still flipping it about twice, two to three times, depending on the recipe. Uh, so after 12 hours, you have this uh, little puck. Uh, we salt it down. And then in the case of the camembert, we also experimented with the crotin, uh, which is a small little French goat cheese. Uh, we spray it down with the penicillium, in this case, a penicillium camembert tea, or penicillium camembert. Yo. <laughs> Yo. No, do it. That's a great question. Um, so I get a little nervous about talking about some things, so thank you for trade backtracking secret. me. No, it's, it, it's not even a trade secret. The, so the milk lipid extraction actually happens, uh, I think the best way to, during this process, I think the best way to really explain it is uh, through a cheese called Briat Savarine. Has anybody ever had this before? Uh, so Briat Savarine is a triple creme, and anytime you hear a triple creme cheese, it just means it's 5% butter fat away from legally being butter. That's it. You have butter at 80%, triple cream at 75%, double cream at 60 
So what we essentially do is uh, we don't get that double cream, triple cream consistency, but we do a cream infusion or a cream uh, enhancement. And in that cream is where our, our, our lipid extraction is. Uh, we do the same thing with the cream when we make our foie gras torchon, uh, but we actually created a whole new process when it comes to our pickles and our lacto-fermented hot sauce, which was uh, essentially finding a way to bind uh, THC and CBD to a sugar molecule in glycerin and an edible glycerin rather than a fat molecule like in a lipid, which is actually uh, Trevor's idea. He doesn't realize how smart he is, but uh, it's pretty, pretty freaking cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the final product uh, takes 60 days. It takes 60 days for me to make one wheel of cheese. Uh, we are about to start an affinage program here uh, in the next year. Uh, it's really weird to think of rent on a business for something that is about this big, but you have to think about how much space this takes up in the course of 60 days and how much that's costing you, uh, which isn't a lot, thank God, uh, <laughs> but, but still something you take into account. Uh, one of the things that we're doing in the future uh, is aged cheese, and, and we have a lab here in, or I'm sorry, we have a lab in Oakland uh, that does all of our dosing testing so that I give you a product that I'm pretty comfortable when I say, this is five milligrams, you know it's five milligrams. Um, one of the things that they're really excited to work on and we're really excited to work on is an aged cheese, especially when you get into here, this is a cheese called Lemuse, it's a two-year-old Gouda. Once cheese hits about uh, eight months old, uh, the microbes actually start breaking down the amino strands uh, and then they'll start to recrystallize. They'll form this really nifty chemical called tyrosin L um, or L tyrosin. And it, it's kind of nifty. It's, I'm sure you guys have seen the, the information that hits uh, social media every once in a while about how cheese is addictive. Uh, this is the chemical that makes cheese addictive. It also releases serotonin and dopamine in your brain. It makes you relaxed, uh, it makes you happy. Uh, and it makes you crave more of whatever gave you that serotonin and dopamine kick. What's going to be really fascinating, besides the fact that you have something on a microbial level acting on a molecular level, uh, which is fascinating on its own, uh, is, what, um, is what these microbes are going to do to the THC molecule a little bit later. We don't really know what that is yet, uh, but in the next year, while we do our R&D, it's going to be really exciting to kind of find out and see if we can create something wholly new. If you look at um, the Indian subcontinent, they do something called banglasi, which is a, a fermented milk drink. And if you've ever seen this made, it's, it's intimidating as hell because they're taking, they're taking these huge stalks of cannabis and they're juicing it and they're adding this to this milk. And you look at it and you're like, there's no way I can drink that. Like, I will, I will die on the floor right now. Uh, but cannabis on its own isn't psychoactive until you decarboxylate it. Uh, you have a, a chem the, the original chemical in a living plant is THCA. Uh, and what you're trying to do when you cure this is take that extra carbon molecule out. And usually you do that by, by curing it about 200 degrees for a couple hours. Uh, in India, they ferment it for a few weeks and that decarboxylation happens on a, on a um, microbial level, but in such a small way that it, it's kind of like drinking a really relaxing chamomile tea beer blend, right? Uh, so it'll be kind of fascinating to see what we can, what we can do in the next, next couple of years with this. Uh, to give you an idea of, of how this works, these are our low-dose pickles. It's about two milligrams per solid and 10 milligrams per one ounce of brine. So if you are a college student and you want to do a pickleback, uh, you can take a little shot of brine, take a little shot of whiskey, wait an hour, see how you feel. If you are not a consumer, have three pickles, see how you feel in an hour, and, and just like with anything, test yourself. Uh, don't drive, don't do anything stupid. Uh, I don't know what cannabis liability will be, but I'd, I'd rather not worry about it. Um, this is our strongest thing, garlic confit, uh, five milligrams per clove, uh, which is about half a tablespoon. Uh, and this is really what we're excited about because it allows a home chef to medicate their own thing. Uh, what we've seen a lot of is mashed potatoes. Uh, a lot of people like to make mashed potatoes. Uh, that get you stoned, but, but that's one of our higher dose items. Uh, we also do something straight out of our kitchen, and actually one of the ways I, I break the law the most is um, uh, we get a, we've been doing private commission for the last year and a half, uh, and we actually step over the line on dairy law much more than I ever step over the line on cannabis law. Uh, I'm not allowed to technically produce this in the city of San Francisco, uh, which is why Oakland is about to get a lot of my business. Um, and they're also not allowed to sell it within the city of San Francisco. 
Uh, it, it's, it's kind of a silly rule, it's kind of an antiquated rule, but if you get into fermented law in general, uh, which we can touch on a little later if you guys want, uh, they're, they're kind of silly on their own. And then just to finish up our product catalog and then we'll touch on what I brought you guys today. Uh, we've been doing a little tapenade. Like I said, the foie gras torchon uh, is right there, about 10 milligrams per uh, two ounces. And then uh, the lacto-fermented hot sauce, which is what we're gonna touch on today. Uh, it won't be medicated, but I'll let you guys know when we put in the glycerin. Uh, and because, like I said earlier, I get to play around with these really rare ingredients, my salt is a little, it's a little on the rare side. It's actually, uh, there, there are much more than this, but this was the fourth one in the United States. It's this little uh, Filipino uh, tribe that makes uh, coconut husk salt. They soak coconut husk in the ocean, they let it dry, they burn it, uh, and then they soak that ash, uh, and then they'll boil it out, and the ash is actually lighter than water, and it acts as this really old, old world uh, uh, filtration system almost. And so you're left with something that is ocean salt, but, but very, very pure in a very, very old way. So instead of using, um, and you're right, you should never use iodized, you should never eat iodized salt. You can bathe with it, it's great, uh, but you should never eat with it. Uh, but I mean, when you get into to fermentation on this level, it's actually pretty simple. Just pull my mic out. Uh, one of the other things that my chef and I bonded over way back when was a love of barbecue. Uh, and, and really, if you get into the history of barbecue, there are all these arguments. Uh, if you go into North Carolina, barbecue is whole hog. Uh, you have to cook the entire animal. You have to do it in a very specific way. If you guys have never seen the North Carolina barbecue trail, uh, you'll be in the middle of tobacco fields for most of your trip there. But if you are a foodie of, of any type, you should definitely make the, make the journey at some point. Uh, Trevor wanted to create a, a style of barbecue that was unique to California and, and its biodiversity. Uh, so here you just have some uh, chopped strawberries, jalapenos, a little uh, uh, fried garlic and onion. Um, and we're just going to put this in our Robocoup. And you guys are more than welcome to try this if you'd like. Like I said, there's not going to be um, um, any medication. At this point though, we would add a little bit of our garlic confit to, to up the dosage. Uh, this is probably... Honestly, our, I, I know I said the garlic confit earlier, but this is probably our, our highest dose thing because our, our goal was to make one taco one dose, one taco a five milligram taco, um, which is, which is kind of cool that we, we actually succeeded, but just do a little bit of salt. Does anybody have any questions while I do this, by the way? Not even a little, awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that's that's fair. Uh, so one of the things that I had to worry about being being the body type that I was uh, while I was going through chemo was keeping weight on. Uh, and one of the most unappetizing things that you can think of uh, while you're going through that experience is like these super cakey, super heavy uh, uh, things. Um, I think we touch a little bit on a healthier option, um, which would be the pickles. Uh, obviously, you have to look at your salt intake depending on, on your, personal, your personal diet restrictions or your personal diet, diet needs. Um, but in, in, in terms of, of health benefits, I mean, that's where really the future of, of this is gonna be anyway. Because if you look at, at where food is now versus the 50s, uh, you see a huge health focus. And we actually are more concerned about health with each passing uh, year. One of, the, one of the companies that tracks my food trends for me uh, has started to send out uh, toxic diets. Have you guys seen toxic diets yet? You'll see it next year, it's gonna be really fun. Uh, <laughs> it's actually uh, uh, essentially people that aren't dietitians, people that don't have a PhD telling you what you should eat, which is never a good idea. Uh, even me up here, me telling you these things, I'm, I'm not a doctor. Um, I, I make things off my own personal experience. Um, uh, but you will see the entire industry shift, one, to a less psychotropic uh, effect, and two, two healthier options. And I hope that, that yeah, touches a little, yeah. 
But yeah, if you guys want to come up and try some of Karen's kraut, by the way, you should. It's delicious. Yeah. <laughs> I only attack when provoked. Yeah. It's this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, a sin to bok. So when it ships, it actually ships with uh, a little bit of the pottery on top. Uh, and I, I had to break it off for a project I was doing a while back. But yeah, the... Uh, it just dries like that with a little circle on the inside. It takes about two months uh, to, finish the, to finish the salt in the pot, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> no, it's a pretty clean salt. It's actually kind of perfect for what we're doing up here. Because it's, it's not a dirty salt. Yeah, please, help yourself. So what's that black thing? Vanilla. Yeah, uh, just a little bit for flavor. So where can I buy your cheese? Uh, in August, at the end of August, you'll be able to buy it at any dispensary that's not in San Francisco. This is a pretty new product. It is. We, like it's, so we've been doing the commission for the last year. Um, and it's, it's, it's been sweet. Um, We've been doing better than I think I ever, I ever hoped that we would do. <laughs> it started off as a hobby, and now it's, it's slowly turning into something a bit more than that. Do you consume? Yeah. Yeah? Good. I like edibles, but I don't know how to cook it or make them. It's, it's tricky. And I mean, even, even when you get into the very base core of, of what that is, which is like culture butter, uh, like weed butter, right? And something very easy, something very simple. There are still better ways to make that that are that are healthier and more applicable to your daily life. Um, yeah. And here we're just gonna do pretty much all this vinegar. How's it going, guys? Good. What's that? Yeah, please. I get a lot of like dinosaur eggs when I bring it in. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. So, uh, so yeah, in the Philippines, they have uh, they'll they'll take coconut husk, uh, spent coconut. They soak it in the ocean for a day, and then they let it dry out. And then they'll light the coconut on fire. They'll get the ash. Uh, they'll incorporate that with ocean water again. And then the, they have these little handmade pots, and they'll actually boil it out. And the ash becomes lighter than the, than the water. So as uh, the water evaporates a bit, it takes the ash with it. Uh, and you're just left with uh, the mineral content and the salt from the ocean. Whole process. Yeah, no, not at all, please. <laughs> yeah. So this is uh, a Sintubak. It's from, uh, there are only about three tribes left in the Philippines that make this. Um, and what they essentially, what? A Sintubak. A Sintubak. Uh, so people who are making this in other places apart from those three tribes? Nope, those three tribes. If they are, I'm not aware of them. We'll put it that way. Uh, so what? Why the salt and not? You know, I just figured I was showing you guys like caviar and hamon and like all this stuff earlier, and I was like, well, I should bring in like one, one thing to kind of back that up. And and so, there's uh, there's about 50 of these in the United States right now. Uh, I was lucky enough to get the fourth, or no, wingtip wingtip got the fourth. I have the tenth. Um, but yeah, so, it, you uh, you wanted to know how it was made again, right? Yeah. So. Uh, uh, there are these three little tribes. Uh, I don't know the exact island off the top of my head, I'm sorry. 
but they take spent coconut husk, they soak it in the ocean, uh, they'll burn the coconut husk to ash, uh, and then they'll uh, essentially wash that ash in the ocean again, and the ashes become lighter, lighter, than, lighter than the water. So when they boil the water off, the vapor takes the, the ash away, and you're left with uh, something that's, that's just a very pure form of, of uh, ocean salt. And when you first get this, uh, it, it looks like it comes on a little stand, but it's actually the handmade pot uh, that they that they put everything in. Um, they're trying to have a bigger presence in the United States because we have such purchasing power, because we have such yeah. buying power. Uh, two of the three tribes that make this uh, probably will stop making it soon. And it's such a it's such an original Filipino style of 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 making a preservative for food that it's kind of sad to see it go i mean it's going to update eventually but um yeah so the the last tribe that we buy this from it's, it's kind of trying to preserve this this ancient culture which i honestly i wouldn't even know how old it is so yeah, yeah please uh, it's 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 sterile on its own and it doesn't take a lot to clean yeah please smell if you guys want here's a microplane uh scrape scrape some on your on your hand and try it uh, because the United States has increased Is buying power. Yeah. The wrong powder? No, do it. <laughs> <laughs> I swear I only do uh, only do cannabis. Uh, so it's it's, it's really very tasty. clean. Yeah, yeah. It's so clean. Um, you know what I didn't realize? Do you have a blade? Blade. Yeah. No. I thought I had prepped all this, and now these little some over here, these really. little yogurt. Yeah, here. If you guys want, please help yourself. Somebody have something sharp? A key? You can't, yeah, you can't just tear it open. No. Sure. There we go. Way to go. <laughs> My grandpa would like you. He said, never leave the house without a lighter and a knife. So here I'm just adding uh, the thing that makes, uh, if we were using our products, we would actually take our medicated whey and add that as well, along with the garlic confit and a little bit of our sugar. Uh, but since I, I can't really serve that to you guys, I'm just doing a little yogurt culture. Uh, and then I have hibiscus uh, powder for, for, fla for looks, actually, because once you see how this goes, and this will actually take a while. Yeah. So can you just have a marinade or just a sauce? Okay. I mean, we were, we were trying to come up with a, a way to season burritos. Okay. So, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, if you, want, if you want it a little thicker, you could, uh, you could do that. Uh, during fermentation, it does liquefy a bit more. You know, it does uh, the the solid and the liquid. But I mean, this will this will run for a second. Well, how long do you marinate? I mean, uh, fermented for three weeks. Three Yeah, the pickles are three. The pick. So to give you an idea of how long everything that we make takes, the pickles take three weeks. The hot sauce takes three weeks. The cheese takes two months. Uh, our cheddar or our gouda production, depending on on what we get funding for, will take eight months. Um, but by the end, you have something really wholesome. Um, you know, earlier the, uh, the gentleman was talking about these, these derived processed foods, which I'm not opposed to at all. Uh, but I think that there are easier ways to make superfoods, especially when it comes to curing and fermenting. Uh, caviar is actually a great superfood. The reason you only have two ounces at a time one, it has as much taurine as one, one can of Red Bull. So if you have two ounces of caviar, you, they, they actually call it doing a bump, <laughs> which is a throwback to the 80s a little bit. But, um, uh, but they actually do call it doing a bump because the, the taurine, it does wake you up. It, it energizes you. But when you ferment these things, uh, Karen, Karen's totally right. You, you are processing it in such a way. And especially when you do get to these older cheeses, uh, you're losing a lot of the liquid, and the reason you don't have a lot of cheese at the end of a cheese plate um, is because really in something like this, all of those aminos, all of those proteins, all of those lipids that are really good for you have been so condensed. Uh, people tend to really like chow down on Parmesan and then avoid brie, and you should actually be doing it the other way around. You, you can chow down on some brie, there's more liquid content there. Uh, you probably shouldn't eat like a pound of Parmesan at a time, that's probably not. It's actually, yeah, it's the dairy. So, so I, like I said, I break the law once every three months. My attorney sends me this nice little thing uh, because cannabis law is essentially still being written. Uh, so there's a lot of gray area. Um, we actually just lost our last commercial kitchen, uh, which is kind of a bummer, so I'm looking for another one. Uh, but a lot of times they come in. 
uh, so the cheese law is where we're, the cheese law is actually where Oakland's gonna get a lot of our business. We're about to do uh, shipping container construction, which will make us as HACCP compliant as possible before we start working with our legislators to, uh, to essentially allow terpenes in the food. And terpenes are, are where, uh, so you have your CBDs, you have your THC. Terpenes are these, uh, these chemical components uh, that, are, that are very scent oriented. So like if you were to taste cauliflower or smell cauliflower, you know that it, what that is by its terpene signature. It's this volatile compound that's, that's at the edge of wine, at the edge of, of these foods. Um, when you get into cannabis, we've noticed that the THC molecule actually reacts specifically with your brain based on the terpenes that surround it. Um, are we done filming? No? I don't know. So, so to give you an idea, my, my friend makes a distillate. Uh, so you have uh, cannabis concentrates, which you have to think of kind of like beer, and then distillates, which you think of kind of like scotch. Uh, but he essentially distills this, this THC down to its, to its liquid level, and then he'll add the terpenes that he thinks uh, people want. So with the sativa blend, which is known to be a little bit, uh, little bit more energizing, a little bit more focus-based, he'll do um, Benzoazinol, which is uh, one of the main chemical components in lemons that kind of wake you up. And so it'll kind of uh, uh, blend both. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Cheers. What was your name? Christine. Matt. Hey. Nice to meet you. Cheers. But yeah, this is it, guys. I would give you a sample. You're more than welcome to taste it. It's not, it's not going to be ready for three months or three weeks, but. I think I'm just gonna leave the color there. Hi, I'm Matt. Steven, Steven nice to meet so you. So it ends up a little um, effervescent or not? Um, no, it does end up spicier. The capsaicin uh, molecule uh, gets broken down a little bit more. Uh, and so you pick up on the, the heat. Uh, so when you have a fermented hot sauce, that is where you're gonna start getting into skull units that are not handle, they're not easily handled by, by people. And I've seen typical fermentation the raw chilies and then just do a puree, just a similar thing? Uh, kind of, and we, we actually, so with this recipe was actually originally an ancho uh, strawberry recipe. Um, like I said, when it, when it came to the demonstration part of what to show you guys, I, I got a little tripped up because I can't give you my, my final products. Um, we fermented the ancho chilies and then we did it that way and that was part of our starter culture for that particular, for that particular product. Here, like I said, uh, and like, uh, oh, and to backtrack again, uh, we also use our way, which is going to be uh, lacto lactoactive. Um, here, since we we couldn't do that, I, I kind of tried to to make it the best way I could, so that you could at least go home and do something similar. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah.